We're recording. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. So let me introduce you both. Um, so Brother King, Royston, he, he, what are you? He my, um, I don't even know. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Ooh, I don't even know where he is. Oh, gosh. So anyway, he can tell you. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Mariella is my everything. I mean, she's my colleague at work. She's my confidant. She's my, um, I don't know, she my, I'm very proud of, she's my daughter. She, mm -hmm. she, she's, yeah. So you can both introduce uh, yourselves. And um, I think, Brother King, you were asking me about the spelling. A yeah, I got it. Yeah. yeah. I just changed the name. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I got You're it. Welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, oh, after you, after okay. you ladies first. <laughs> Good morning again. First, Dr. Richards, you look so gorgeous. Um, I know it's not to do with the meeting, but you look so gorgeous. Like, yeah. if I had to put up a picture, there's a brother that if I had to put up a picture of the perfect dark man, the perfect African man, like, he comes to my, he's dark, 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 melanin rich and everything. Not saying you know, disrespect to any other brothers. But if I had to put out a picture of a beautiful African black woman, the way how you look right now, I mean, the way how your hair is, the head wrap, you look gorgeous. Thank you, um, Thank you. I am Mariella, like Dr. Richard said. I'm her, I'm her assistant. Um, she's also been my, my unofficial mentor, mentee mentor um she has influenced my life i feel really blessed like i tell her like if um i'm so privileged to have access to her and the pearls of wisdom that she drops every day has enhanced my life whereas mm -hmm. before i used to move like yeah i'm a queen like no it's like i'm a queen like okay. there's certain behaviors i okay. don't accept there's yes. certain treatment that i must get um, I deserve nice things. I deserve everything that is good. But now um, I am Mariella. Um, my friends also call me I marry, and it was I marry a lot. Um, I'm a sister. I'm a mother. I'm a daughter. Um, besides being an administrative assistant, I am now a jeweler. I'm a sister to many sisters out there now. Um, I. I'm not so sure. I don't want to be too vain in saying that I am somewhat of a healer, mm -hmm. um, but I think I kind of am. I, I interact with you. Am. You actually are. <laughs> yeah. I interact now. Something that started so simple and starting out of me having to do something to, to pass my time um, has turned into me interacting with a lot of um, my sisters and helping to build them up, helping them to feel good about themselves and passing on some of the stuff that Dr. Richards has passed on to me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. We're going to see Mandem walking around behind me. <laughs> your, life wouldn't be, your life wouldn't be perfect without them, so. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. All right. That is so true. Thanks for the king. Mm -hmm. Um, so my name's Royston. I am, yeah, I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. Um, nice. Community community activist. Um, a quiet one, though. I'm not. I'm not that person that stands out. Like, you know, but I'm tenacious, nevertheless. Um, yeah, I. Um, I like learning. I'm always open to learning. Um, and I like passing on what I've learned. So I like sharing. I like supporting. I love, I love my community, our community, my people. Um, sometimes deeply frustrating, but I love anyway through that frustration, you know? Um, you know, because I understand the, the reason for the frustration and what's behind that frustration. And um, I work. I work with people. I'm a professional business coach. That's kind of my main income stream. Um, 
I also do emotional intelligence on conscious bias training. Um, so, you know, the first one for 20 years, the second one for 18 years, and that's on the back of almost 30 years public sector management experience. Um, I was, yeah, probably one of the youngest managers in, in the whole local government s structure, um, youngest black manager in the local government mm. structure, you know, in times when you had to get to 40 to be a manager and I was doing the thing at 25, you know, wow. Wow. <laughs> what have you, you know. <laughs> But never actually thinking anything of it. It's only as I look back over years, I think, whoa, you did that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, Sister Doctor and I go back a long way. Yeah, a long way. And, um, you know, she's a, she's a sister, she's a friend, she's a, she's a confidant. And I take the confidant over your taking the confidant. <laughs> It's all right. you, know, I can you know what I mean? No, it's all right. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just showing you that you know that it's we so can good. share. This, uh, you know, and she, she was shareable. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. What else would I say? Um, we talk about a range of things, and we, um, we collaborate on a number of things, and um, there's so much more to to go and to happen. You know, and even though we had a a vacuum of years it was like once we reconnected it was like those vacuum just that period just disappeared like it didn't exist understood, yeah understood. yeah yeah thanks so um, yes i'm very very thrilled and honored that you know you're both available to um share with me this part of my journey mm -hmm. and um <laughs> so you will both know that I have a real commitment to our community and, mm -hmm. you know, unapologetically so. Mm -hmm. I think that we've been through enough of a Eurocentric standard and a Eurocentric way of being. And, and when we come and we talk about our divinity mm -hmm. and our history and mm -hmm. our whatever, we almost have um, a kind of apologetic tone, like, we don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to offend. I don't want to, you know, and actually I'm tired of that. I think that we really need to bring it. And so um, you, the noise you're going to hear in the background is one of the, I'm calling them the mandem because when Brother Kim and <laughs> we talk about the mandem, I have not been able to get some of the things that I get done done without good sister friends mm -hmm. and good brothers coming around. And, um, mm -hmm we fondly refer to them as the mandem because mm -hmm. you know i i mean i got i got kings i got <laughs> queens i got prince and princesses uh all kinds of people who just allow me to be able to live that in a queendom i live in a queendom and mm -hmm. um and i'm choosing who my company is as i say show me your company and I'll tell you who you are. So mm -hmm. I'm choosing who my company is. And so as part of what I have been doing recently, uh, especially since this whole, you know, new normal, as they call it, the kind of mm -hmm. lockdown. And even before, um, as we are getting older and we're taking care of our elders and lots of things are being revealed to me um, over and above the rites of passage programs that I've already been through. Mm -hmm. We, there are conversations that we are starting to have and things that we are learning on the journey. And I had a conversation with um, um, Sister Aymari a few times um, and, and Brother King as well about us capturing some mm -hmm. things and allowing mm -hmm. others to learn from the journey that we've been on rather than everybody kind of learning mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. ground zero. Um, so our elders are very dignified, uh, very private often. Uh, they've been through many hardships and some we will never know because of the colonial intervention and the hostile climate and the name calling, because we get called all kinds of stuff, you know, 
we, we've been yeah. called, I'm not even going to repeat the names that we've been called. And we've been called out of our name. Yeah. You know, <laughs> people are not recognizing that actually we have contributed a huge amount to the world and we should be treated appropriately. Mm -hmm. And we learn some of this stuff as our elders become frail and they need us more. We learn so much um, and we see their personalities change from who they were when we were children to who they become when we start taking care of them. And it is that conversation I wanted to have now because I'm wanting to um, maybe do a couple of podcasts or something about that part of the journey the one where you then start you turn into the elder and you need things done for you mm -hmm. and some of the things that they would not necessarily have talk, spoken to us about because it's mm -hmm. private or they've always been independent or there's a realization that they are actually um in the twilight of their years so on and so forth so um all three of us have been in a position where we've had to support our elders. And um, I think we could just talk for about 20 minutes, half an hour. We don't have to talk for long because I'm looking for the, the themes, not necessarily everything that happened on our journey because we could be here for a long time. But if we, if we were going to do this, what would be the things that you think that we should talk about? What could be a topic? So for me, a topic could be um, learning or, or the early signs, the early signs that actually my mother or my father are not like they used to be. Something has happened or something is happening. You know, um, uh, maybe another one is just um, that, 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 that area between um, asking for their permission and taking authority. So yeah. like, you know, there's a thing where, that happens where you just realize we, we'd normally, wait, they would ask us, but now we have to step in and say, actually, mom, no, you can't, or dad, no, you can't, or this is the best thing for you to do, or, uh, and how you do it. Um, uh, uh, and another a third one and then I, I, i'd like you just you guys just to tell me i don't want to call you you guys i don't like that actually i don't like that term at all you guys it's a youtube thing that happens hi you guys i don't like it <laughs> um, <laughs> um what happens when they transition you know there are arrangements that need to be made and uh, even before you maybe call you know, when do you call a doctor? When do you call 999? When do, who do you call? What do you do with them in between that time? You know, when they've actually expired, then what? You're sitting there and they can't respond to you anymore and they've not got cold yet, but what now? Um, so yeah do you have any other thoughts because i know you've both been very close to this and um i want to do it justice i want to make sure that we we you know and i could write a book but i don't you know maybe i will write a book but i think more immediately as we're now in this position more and more of us are in this position we need to be able to say go to so and so and you get an idea of of what's going to happen or what could happen or what you should do or what to be careful of, you know, um, some things are, are nice and some things are not so nice, you know, like your siblings start to, you know, become different people and you become a different person. Um, people start to come around and or things start to go missing. Like mm. people just pick up the sitting and gone with it <laughs> because, you know, um, yeah, so do you want to, anybody want to jump in first? Whatever comes to mind. I don't mm -hmm. want to be prescriptive. I really don't. Yeah. Okay. Um, so some of the things you touched on in terms of, yeah, um, the, the hardship of age, the hardship of getting older, um, where as an individual, you realize that you have to make some adjustments. 
and um, the the denial of having to make those adjustments. You know, um, you know, at a simple level, when do you stop driving your car? <laughs> yeah, you stop driving your car, um, and therefore you can't go shopping like you used to anymore. You know, just for the groceries. You can't just run down the road anymore, you know? So um, it moves into a dependency, you know? And from being strong, tenacious, being the matriarch or the patriarch, and now um, having to submit is hard, it's difficult. Um, for you, submission of leadership, um, but also for the children of being able to recognize and begin for them also to move beyond denial and to step into leadership, who now becomes that responsible person. The, um, and with that comes the sibling rivalry or argument about who has the time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who has the time Whose, whose job is more important than who, <laughs> who can, you know, what day of the week and, you know, and yeah, yeah to take care of, mm-hmm. you know, and with that comes the emotion of love. And you can find that the, the person with the potentially most time and space to take care of is the person who felt that they were loved the least <laughs> by yeah. that parent. So there's a sometimes a resentment to have to step into that role, you know? Um, so there's a whole emotional spectrum that's going on. And, and because there's a structural framework of guilt amongst the siblings, the, the guilt leads to arguments, you know, trivial arguments. So um, a brother at the moment is saying, you know, I've got my mother sorted and back on her feet. And then the sister comes around and he's looking after the parents, you know, five, six, seven days a week. And then the sister comes around and says, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not doing that and what have you. And destabilizes the support arrangement. So um, things go backwards, mother get ill again. You know, he gets angry with the sister because she's disrupted the pattern, but she's thinking that she's doing something that's best for the mum, but she's not there, she's not seeing, you know. And, you know, that thing about the medication, once you destabilize the medication, it takes several weeks to get that back into order. Um, so acceptance, and what does that look like? Um, so in, inevitably, there is a fear of old age. Yeah, there's a fear that begin to creep up on that individual. You mean I really can't do that anymore? I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. You know, um, at, you know, I I have a little thing going on with me that says um, I can still. You know that thing that's fallen out the cupboard? I can still catch. I can still catch it down here. <laughs> you know, and what happens when the day comes when I'm too slow to catch it down oh. here? You know, and and don't ask me why, but I've that's my barometer. <laughs> you know, the day will come when I can't, you know, react and catch it. So moving into admission, and then seeking that support from a place of pride, asking, you know, would you help me? Can you can you? I've got this appointment. I need some support. I don't always remember what the doctor say and what he tell me. I should is it one time a day or is it ten times a day? You know. All of that, um, you know, happens. So you begin to find out, um, the parents find out through the, through the children, the children find out amongst themselves, who really cares? Yeah? Um, and who cares enough? Because somebody's got to make some adjustment, you know, and... Um, Nine times out of ten, it's a woman and she's got children and she's got family and she's trying to make, you know, already a balancing act. And here's this additional layer, you know, that comes. 
So um, the adjustments, the conflicts that come out of it, um, the burden of responsibility, medication, what props are needed. You know, um, my auntie, what I notice. So the cycle, and it's a simple cycle that um, she don't drink enough. She gets a urine infection. She gets a urine infection. Um, they give her some sort of penicillin. Penicillin knocks her out. She has to be hospitalized. She's hospitalized for some weeks. All right? um, and then there's a whole process to normalize in and getting her back home. All because she hasn't drunk enough water. Mm. Yeah. Um, I remember my mother, um, I'm from Grenada, passing out in, the, in St. George's because it was hot. Because she hadn't drunk enough water. And she hadn't drunk enough water because I don't want to get caught out. <laughs> you know, because it's not so convenient as a woman to get caught out. So I didn't drink enough water and then the heat, you know. So that cycle too. So you almost have to force feed them water to keep them, you know, on a level. And, and each, you know, I'm going back to my auntie. Each time she came out of hospital, she was a little bit weaker. So her home adjustments needed to be made. And then my cousin worked out that social workers in hospital say, yeah, man, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, and discharge her. And once you discharge her, they wipe their hands. They're not coming around. So the strategy that he says that let's make the adjustments need to be made first. No, she's not coming home. No, she's not coming home. The adjustment hasn't been made. And only when the adjustment's been made, then she comes home. Because otherwise, you know. Um, and then there's a big one. There comes a point in time when, as they, you know, there's loss, function, functionality, um, cognizance, all of that is compromised. And the doctor is saying there's not, nothing else that we can do. You know, they may be on some form of life support system. You know, and the doctor is saying there's nothing more we can do. And the family has to make a decision. And that's another round of arguments. You know, do we turn this machine off? You know, do we keep this machine on, you know, for some weeks? And the hospital is itching because they've got somebody else in the queue that wants the bed, that wants the machine and all of that that's going on. You know, so all of that. Um, and then, and I'm, I realize I'm saying it. <laughs> Thing, but okay. then it's, okay. forgive the noise that you're going to hear shortly, though, because one of the that's fine. Are, um, actually, that's fine. Because the these are all specialists, every one of them is a yeah. specialist. Um, so you're going to hear a little noise. Let me just, yeah. just man them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks <Sean. laughs> and, yeah. and then there's the arrangements beyond, you know, and you know, that arrangement beyond the grave and um, where some parents have left a will that says blah and some would take up and rip up the will because they've read it and it, it don't go in their favour. So if they rip it up, then it don't exist or decide that, um, you know, although that parent said this, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. Then there's the argument about the family silver. She promised me this or I need this as a memento of her and what have you talking to one recently she said you've got two sons one of the sons came and took the car <laughs> you know um it's my dad's car and i want to feed my dad but you know but it's not his to take he's just taking it and the other son is saying well he can't take the car because you know we're all entitled to that so um you know so and then there's the the new leadership i realized that when my mother passed the time it you know, and even though she was no longer functioning, hadn't been functioning for some time, she was still alive. But once she's passed, I am it. And psychologically, there's a big transition that happens to me in my head. Um, you know, and I have to be more mindful of my relationship with my sister now, you know, because I have to, um, the relationship is good enough, but I have to ensure that as the elder, I, I bring the wisdom to keep that relationship in a good place. So even if she's ranting about something, my job as the elder is to keep the relationship in a good place, you know, <laughs> um, which is a, a strange, 
a strange persona and feeling that um, emerges in that place. Wow. Wow. There's a lot, there's a lot in there and I, and I, and I really, I empathize with so much of it. <laughs> so much of it, like, wow. Wow, thank you, King. And, and you're currently in the UK. Yeah. And, um, sister Amari is in Barbados. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to hear not only from a woman, but from someone in a different country. Yes. Um, I think many of these things, even though we may be living in different places in the diaspora, there's some mm -hmm. stuff that's going to be the same. It doesn't really yeah. matter where we're yes. living. So, yeah, I, I just give thanks for that. Um, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a little journey that you took me on. Mm -hmm. I identify with every single aspect of it. Yeah. Every yeah. single aspect. Um, yeah. Just Imari. Um, a lot of what you both said, I I can relate to. I think you guys covered a lot. The only thing that I would just not the only thing. One thing that I'm not sure if I think I heard you guys saying was support, support for the caregiver, um, yes. and the caregiver's help, yes. and the caregiver taking a time out. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking care of my mom. It was, I finish work, I go home. Mm -hmm. Weekends, I'm home. And then sometimes your friend w wants you to hang. And you can't mm -hmm. hang because you have to take care of your mother. And I tell people it was an honor for me to do so because I had a mother who loved me. I mean, loved me. Mind you, she loved all her children. It's not saying she loved me more than she loved one. But it was an honor for me to do that. And that was my main responsibility and then some friends not understanding hey i can't attend an event i can't give support to anything and like you um i'm a pan-africanist and and you mentioned but i'm a community activist too even though now that is quiet so i couldn't attend some meetings and some persons took offense um mentally though i wasn't i wasn't totally bothered because my primary responsibility was my mom but I also had the need to, to take a break. So I used to take a vacation um, each year for a, approximately a month and leave the country. Mm -hmm. And that was my way of just taking a break, having a, a, a moment to relax. And not even though when I was away, I was still thinking of her and calling and you know, video calling. But the caregiver also needs that time a way to regroup and a part of it could be being a caregiver could be depressing at times <laughs> really really depressing i remember one one morning I, I i came to work and i went in dr richard's office and i sat down and cried and my colleague she missed me for a moment and she came and she was like what's wrong because i felt like if my mother was disabled like if she was going like i could see her going and there was nothing they could do about it and to see someone who was so strong physically, who held you, who carried you, you know, to see the, 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 the deterioration of them is like, it could be depressing. And, you know, that aspect of it too. Um, like yesterday, I, I met a lady in town who lost her mom. So I was talking to her and such like, and she said, she said, you know, I saw it, but I saw it coming. I saw her going, I know she was going, but it still hit me, it still hit me when it happened. And it, I was never in the role of caregiver before having my mother. So there was nothing that really prepared me um, for it. It was, you know, something you learn, but then there are people who, who will teach you things, you know, but there's not a manual, just like when I became a parent, there's no manual, but there's some examples you see around you and you learn as you grow. Whereas if there's some things that you knew beforehand, some stuff could be avoided, like even in terms of choosing a caregiver, yes. in terms of choosing that support system. And then also how do we support each other in their journey? Mm -hmm. So my mom has transitioned and my father is at this stage you now where he needs to be taken care of. And it's totally different. And my son, I have a 19 year old son and he, he was there, he was helping. So he has the experience because he lived with me and my mom. He lives, you know, we live together. 
he has that experience and he was phenomenal. He just stepped in and played such a, I mean, for such a young child, the things that he did, the things that we know can get to be like a bit messy and so on, he did. But now we're taking care of my dad and he's like, you know, this is different. And it is so different. Number one, as much as I, I, I talked about a mother who loved me and what an honor it was, but my father, this is a man that I never thought loved me, you know, who wasn't there at all, you know. But now I'm faced with the responsibility of taking care of him. And that emotional connection is not there, like how it was with my mother, but yeah. he's still my responsibility, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. And whereas my mother lived with me, he does not live with me. And my mother, her demeanor was so different. She was a strong woman, but then she got down and she humbled out a lot too. I guess because, you know, she wasn't physically able. My father, he is, he is demanding. Mm. He's very, very demanding. And like I said, because of how the relationship, he's just so demanding. Mm. Um, and he's full of sarcasm. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah, like, doctor, so. yeah, mm. it is, it is different. Mm-hmm. And he does not live with me. So, okay. but I still sorry, have to make sure. I apologize. Um, yeah, no I am muted. The reason mm-hmm. I'm muted is because I'm speaking to the man then. Mm-hmm. So okay. I'm, All right. I didn't realize. I saw your lips moving. So I yeah, didn't... yeah. No problem. No problem. I appreciate that. No, That's there fine. Are people, there are people on the property, so they were coming and going. That's fine. That's and, fine. And so I'm just speaking to them and not interfering with what's being mm-hmm. said. So, yes. um, and I'm doing this this way, just so everybody <laughs> knows I'm doing this this way because we mm-hmm. live, you know what I mean? I, often when we mm-hmm. have Zoom calls, we mm-hmm. shut down everything. Like I go into a room yeah. and nobody can come yeah. in and there's a blind, yeah. and, you know, the lights yeah. are just so, but we live, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? This lockdown thing makes it seem like we don't live. We live. Yeah. Yeah. Coming yeah. Out. So that's yes. what's happening. Um, yes. Please continue. I'm just, I'm not, if, if I turn the um, camera off, it'll be because there's too much distraction. But I mean, no problem. All right. No problem. No problem. Yeah. So it's a whole different experience with him as a man. Mm. Um, it's a whole different experience with him because he's not been there. Um, mm. Then most of my relatives are outside of Barbados because my family is from St. Vincent. Okay. So with my mother, with my mother though, because of how she was, um, because she was a lady who raised her nephews and so on, and she took care of people. So when when it came to her time, we had somewhat, even though we didn't have the extension in the community that we would have had if we were in St. Vincent, or if all my siblings were here, we still had a few persons that would come and you know, see her, drop off bread food for her because she likes bread food. Um, that viewed her as their aunt, that even the ones that were from afar will come, will, will, will still do what they can do from afar. So mm-hmm. a, a, a nephew who she took care of, she was there when, he, when his mother went into labor with him. When he had to sleep at the hospital, she slept with him. So he was like, he's in Canada, but he's sending in a barrel because that's his aunt who took care of him. Mm-hmm. Um, my father does not have that because he, he was the type of person who wanted to be alone. And now he does not want to be alone. He wants us to be dear. And he cries if we're not dear. So it's a bit, it's a bit mm-hmm. different. The man, mm-hmm. the man um, moving things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah, <laughs> it is different. And then, mm-hmm. and then it's like what you mentioned before. Um, some siblings initially, when I started to take care of my mother, it was hard. I had to pray for patience and strength, and I got it. Um, <laughs> and I'm praying again <laughs> with my father too for patience and strength. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember. I'm being honest here, feeling a bit of resentment initially. Yeah. Because there were times my mother would be, like if I'm sleeping, when my sleep is disrupted, and I'm like, oh gosh, all my siblings are home comfortably sleeping, <laughs> and I'm here. Mm. And then not being, 
not not your role sometimes being recognized as I'm the one who's here. I'm the one who has to get up in the night. Um, I'm the one who has to do certain things. Mm-hmm. And then like my only sibling who's here in Barbados, I, I accept his role because he was a person who was able to take care of the caregiver. But at times, even though at times he will, he will acknowledge and say, you know, thank you, you're doing such a good job. And that's because one morning he came and everything was spotless and mommy was spotless. And when the caregiver came, she was in a good state, you mm-hmm. know, even though it was something that, that was at a cost to me. For instance, it's a cost to me to get late, get to work late. Because if I'm leaving home and she's in a mess and the caregiver has not arrived, I have to clean her up. I have to make sure she has breakfast. And I run it. Thankfully, I had a very good supervisor, you know. That if anything is wrong, she would say, Mariello, go. There was one morning where I was running late because of that. And I called Dr. Richards, said, Dr. Richards, I'm running late. But I didn't tell her why. So then when I got to work and I tell her, I said, you know, I'm here now, but my baby was in such a, such a state. That, and she was like, go back home. I was, she's like, go back home. I'm not comfortable with you being at work um, in the position your mom is. Go back home. Not everybody has that, you know. And... That morning when I when I stayed late to clean her up and you know whatever put whatever was dirty and so just doing it out immediately. When he came and he saw everything, he was like so appreciative. But then there are moments when I don't think that he appreciated the part that I played, as in being there with her, you know, and just being there. Even though I appreciate the part that he played in terms of finance. And he made this statement again last week because my dad had to go to the doctor. I told him I can't take the time to go. You have to take him. Just let me let me just take care of you and, and just say yeah. that um, uh, just be aware of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So reference was made to a part where, oh, this is like this again. I have to do such and such. But I'm like, that's not fair because I did, I did a particular role, you know, like, I did a particular role. So it's like, sometimes the roles that each other play not being appreciated, um, that, is, that is one aspect of it. And the difference between taking care of a male and taking care of a female, you know. Yes, yes. Um, there's certain things that I don't want to see when it comes to my father, like, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> my mom is like my father I don't want to I don't, I don't want to so I've never changed his, so far these last few weeks I've never changed his pamper because I don't want to see there but with my mother it was like totally different so the difference in rules of of the child <laughs> who the person is and then you mentioned something about and I think that Richard's mentioned about, about it too doing these things and seeing your parents um, grow older it makes you look at your own mortality mm-hmm. like I wonder when I get old how things will be mm-hmm. will I have anyone there for me what preparations do I have to make and early this year I fractured my foot and all that <laughs> came into play I couldn't drive mm-hmm. I couldn't move around I had to depend mm-hmm. on my son to do certain things I had to depend on my brother to do certain things and it made me think, jeez, when I get old. And then I was home for a period of time, not going out, just home. And then my brother took me to the doctor. And when he took me to the doctor, I, I remember he paused at Warren's, a gas station. And I saw cars passing, I saw people. And it felt so good to be outside. And they hit me. I was like, how about this is why my mom was so excited to go to the doctor and to go to church because it was her moment of being out. So even all that, that yes, you might be taking care of them, but think, but still the moments for them to be out, to not just be home, stuck at home, you know, the, the, the a holistic way for them to live as an elder. Yeah. So all that came into, came into my thoughts. But it will be it will be good, you know, to have and I guess the way we operate as a people is that you learn by your experience. Mm-hmm.
you learn by actually doing it. But probably it would be good if you if you had some, you know, knowledge of it and just a basic guidance. This is what to do, what not to do. You said in terms of giving up, uh, when to step in and take authority. And that is important, I think, to know when to take authority at a certain time. And then how do you get authority from someone who is still who still thinks that they're functioning well? How do you take it? Because at a certain time, if you don't take some form of authority, even in terms of power of attorney, mm -hmm. then it makes it difficult yes. for you to take care of this person. Mm -hmm. So, and I think some elders have a fear that, okay, if I give access to my funds, mm -hmm. this child will, and, and it, I guess it has happened because according to my dad's attorney, she says she's seen cases where it happened, mm -hmm. where you give your child your money, your property, whatever, before you transition, and then that's it, they're done with you. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. how does another decide when to give authority? And as a child, how do you say you have to take authority without the elder being suspicious that you're just going to take authority and just leave them? Mm -hmm. With my dad, we had to approach the, the conversation of taking authority. And he's very, he's very strong headed and stubborn. Eh? So then afterwards, when he took a talk, he was in the hospital, he's like, he said, he told me, he said, you know, you told, you told me that I have to let you guys take control. You know, and you guys will take care of me. And it was very hard for me to do. Mm. Very, very hard. But I can see that he made the best decision. So that was like, okay. Yeah. It was yeah. Like, but initially, it wasn't that. It was yeah. like, yeah. to give you guys authority. Mm. To make money and everything. Yeah. And yeah. take what? Y'all run off and leave me? Yeah. So it is when, when to step in and take it. And mm -hmm. as an elder too, when to give it. Mm -hmm. And how do you give it not knowing that your children are, your caregivers will not take advantage of you? Mm -hmm. Because there are people who take advantage yeah. of the elderly. And mm -hmm. when you're not there, how can you monitor the situation? How can you make sure that your elder, the one that you love so much, is being taken care of mm -hmm. in your absence? Wow. Mm. Wow, really, you know, um, some, some serious things. I mean, I, I think that, I think that the thoughts I had about doing some podcast or something about this is clearly a good one. I think mm -hmm. we do need to do this. I think um, the approach, I, uh, it would be good to get your feedback, but the approach would probably be that they are short, maybe 15 minute things so people can just go in and come out because it's mm -hmm. going to be difficult, I think, for some people uh, in a number of ways. Some people will not have elders who are at that stage yet, so they really don't have that kind of interest. Some mm -hmm. people will be in it, and so they don't have the time, and it may be traumatic for them because they're in it. Some people will have come through the other end, so they will be, have made the transition, and now they're learning this. And so this will be making them think, oh, if only I had known, and therefore yeah. it will be hard for them. So I think these sessions can't be too long. They need to be... Mm -hmm you know, jump in at this topic, mm -hmm. jump in at that topic. Um, so it's really, you know, really, really, really I'm grateful for having the opportunity to have this conversation. And even uh, the bit that um, you, Sister Amari, were just mentioning, you know, how do you make sure that your loved one is being taken care of? So, you know, how when the carer is assigning someone to do caring, how can you monitor that the carer is caring? You know what I mean? Not that the carer is there and getting paid because sometimes they're there and they're getting paid, but they're not caring. You know, so what does caring even look like? You know, I've had, I've, I've had an experience of having the most amazing carer. Um, and then there was a, a moment at which I realized that the level of caring wasn't sufficiently in order. So I had to 
intervene and say, yeah, I know that you're, you know, you're keeping really good company. Uh, my mother's enjoying you and everything, but hang on, this side of it needs attention. Um, and then, you know, you also have to learn when you have other carers come in, what the, what the system expects you to do. And, and, and even if they don't, uh, what you would want the system to do so that they don't get like bed sores. You know, no. the system may say, you know, someone has to be with them and they have to be cleaned and blah, blah, blah. But at what point do you know that this, this loved one can't shift themselves anymore and so their skin and their flesh is compromised and that can lead to an infection which can then lead to blood poisoning which can then lead to them becoming disorientated which then they have to go into hospital and then you have the dnr you know the do not resuscitate assigned to them without your knowledge because when they get to a certain age the system doesn't think they're worth anything and they'll say well you know they've got to a certain age now we can't do anything for them and if you're not informed you'll say oh Okay, then, you know, but actually, if you're informed, you can actually assert your rights, if you know what your mm. rights are. And if you know what to look for, what's a DNR? How many of us know that these things are assigned to our elders? So if anything happens, mm. they won't resuscitate them. So if they could be choking on something and the people then will just leave them, make them <laughs> expire. Yeah. And this is not right. Um, but I was actually told that, um, by the doctor, that um he said that my father was in once he because he's in such poor health that he's not a candidate i think that they would try to resuscitate there you go mm -hmm. they yeah. make clinical decisions and you're not yeah. involved at some some point you're just not involved because you know what do you know you're a family member these are medics brother king you're trying to say something i know we're gonna conclude now shortly all right so one or two more headings <laughs> <laughs> okay. What headings um, have you got so far? We need to just have headings so that I can just do the vlog with the headings. But say your piece and then say what the headings are that you may have. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some, some things that's come up is that um, there was an elder that we were supporting and we were explicit with the hospital, anything, call us. And we got a call the Sunday morning saying, oh, she passed her in the night. But we found out later that all through the night she kept calling for my ex-wife. All through the night she kept calling for her. And they didn't make the call, you know? So she died alone and that was painful. Gosh. Yeah, when we found that out. Um, so there's that other little head into fear of falling. Yes. And uh, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and, and that became a thing for my mother. Eventually she stopped walking. So we had to lift her everywhere. Thank goodness she'd come down from a size 18 or 20 to a size eight <laughs> or whatever, because they could lift her, um, you know, making decision whether to put her in a home. You know, we tried the combination of the caregiver coming to the house, um, and it wasn't enough support. We made a decision to put her in a home. And one of the homes we put her into, um, they just drugged them. They just drugged them so that um, within a, a week, she had become from somebody who was cognitive to a, a vegetable because they, the drugs they were keeping her docile. And they'd got a, a doctor who, this was in Trinidad, they got a doctor who wasn't a resident of that country. He'd come from somewhere else, you know. Um, and we didn't expose that, but it seems like he was writing these sed sedative drugs to the home as a basis for keeping patients quiet, you know. Um, you know, the other things you talked about, things getting stolen from the home. And um, my auntie my cousin put in CCTV so at least they can see from work who's come in, what time they've come in, what they're doing, what they're saying, because, you know, we say take them to the shower, but they'll do a dry wash, <laughs> you know, rather than take them to the shower at times. Um, 
when I remember when I arrived in Trinidad, my sister said, okay, she's yours now. So, um, you know, my mother was bedridden, so I had to do everything. You, you run in from cleaning your dad, but, you know, cleaning, cleaning your mother is so much harder because you got to find these little um, nooks and crannies. To... <laughs> you don't have nooks and crannies. What are you talking about? <laughs> we, we have holes. <laughs> we have gentle folds. <laughs> yeah. So it's, but it's making my way through these folds. It's, you know, to clean and make sure everything is clean, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm not a squeamish man, so I can manage that. But the fact that she said, no, I've, and I, and I initially I was kind of, what, you want me to clean mom? But actually I, I realized that she needed respite, you know, she needed, yeah. she needed that break, you know? So, um, yeah, the, the, um, what else? Yeah, the whole, the whole, and now, oh yeah, the Alzheimer's and dementia factor you know um the and, signs of it yes and you know when my auntie was physically strong and able to go out she'd go out the house and we couldn't find her we didn't know where she'd gone <laughs> you know um and thankfully a lot of the time she used to go to mcdonald's so you'd find her in mcdonald's but if you didn't find her in mcdonald's you didn't know where to find her you were just literally roaming the street looking for her you know um, so that too is a challenge and she can't, she couldn't tell anybody where she lived, mm. <laughs> you know, so that too is a challenge and, um, mm. yeah, mm. and, and yeah, and you mentioned about, uh, I wrote down a will, you know, that, you know, the impact of a will and, um, will needs not being met or will destroyed or fudged or, um, you know, all of those. Yeah. All of those things. Then. You know, um, this is this is really really powerful because it's just throwing up all kinds of things. Um, yeah, there the, the may be a, oh, yeah. an, there may be an issue in terms of dementia caused by Alzheimer's or caused by whatever it's caused by. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are situations where the uh, senses, you know, the, the sensory aspects may diminish mm -hmm. so they can't mm -hmm. hear so well they can yes. think properly they don't yeah. have dementia they just can't mm -hmm. hear so well or they yes. can't see so well or they don't mm -hmm. taste in the way they used to so they're always asking for more sugar or more salt or more you know they just yeah. things are not tasting the same or they don't feel yeah. the same mm -hmm. you know the aspects of ourselves that become impaired and what do we know yes. about it and how can yes. we stop them from feeling like they're a burden? That's the other thing. Like, I don't want to be a burden mm. on you. I don't want to, mm. you know, so they want something to eat or they mm. want something to drink and they don't want to be a burden on you. Um, so, you know, there's several things, that are, uh, conversations that we just, mm. maybe we never had. But, and, yeah, go on. Yeah. And then um, you touched on the, the financial aspect. So I'm in the UK, my sister's in Trinidad and, um, and she's saying, well, mom needs help, you know, and we need, we need to help mom, you know, but she can't say, well, you know, I need financial support to help mom, <laughs> you know, and it, so I have to second guess and say, well, well, you know, well, what do you need? Well, what does this cost? And what does that cost? Well, I don't know. And, you know, because she can't talk money, mm. you know, and a lot of us can't talk money mm. that it costs this and it costs that. You so, know yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, so all of that was a trip trying yeah. to work out what the itemized cost of this and, you know. Tell you, that's a serious yeah. thing. That's yeah. A thing because we but don't, yeah, we don't talk money. Go ahead. Yes. And that's running with, um, you know, the, the balancing act of um, my then wife saying, but how much money are you putting into this and who's the way, you know, and what they, you know, and how comes you carrying the share of this and, yeah. And and I'm I'm prepared to do what I can because I'm here and I'm not there in the physical. Yeah, so, but it's not easy when you're in the UK either. And you know the idea that when you're mm, abroad, you have the money. You're in the states, mm, you have the money. You know, yeah. being black in the UK is harder than being black in a black yeah. population. 
You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. there are all kinds of dynamics. And the whole money discussion is an interesting one as well because uh, you have, you, you get means tested. You mm. know, people want, mm. the, the system wants to know how much money you have before we mm. help. Even mm. though these people have been paying into the system yeah. all of their lives. Yeah. So, you know, you now have to justify and justify and explain and, exp you know, mm. over and over again. They want to know what you've got. They want to know what whoever she knows has got and he knows. Mm. Has got. And there's a whole thing they make you go through, mm -hmm. which kind of diminishes your, you know, you're, you're already trying to work out things. And then mm. if you're uh, maybe not in the Car maybe not in the UK, but you're in the Caribbean or somewhere else, you go to the bank. You're in the bank for like three hours. Yeah. You are yeah. in the bank for yeah. three hours. <laughs> Yeah. First of all, mm. I mean, when I go for my own money, mm. my own money in the bank, I have had situations where they say, you have to sign that again because your signature is not the same as the signature that's on the system. <laughs> what? Been there. Been there. <laughs> Been there. What? And, you know, I, and I've signed three times on an occasion until I get to the state where I'm like, I want to see the manager. Yeah. I want to see the manager because for, now, now you're having a conversation with someone. Yeah. It's not their fault. They're trying to do their yeah. job, but they're not yeah. using discretion for whatever yeah. reason. You have someone you have to take care of. You need to get back to work. And they're making you jump through these monkey hoops. Mm -hmm. And then you then start having this conversation about, you know, well, this is my style. And I'm sure everybody else doesn't do it. And I recommend that they don't do it because, you know, maybe everyone doesn't want to sit in a police cell and read a book. <laughs> but... You know, when I start saying things like, tell me who would want to be me. And clearly me, I've signed this four times now. I've got an ID. Look at the ID. I've got a passport. In fact, I've got two passports. I've also got a driving license. I've got yeah. an NIF card. You know, yeah. I look like myself. So why are you yeah. telling me that the signature doesn't matter? Is something wrong with you? You can <laughs> Because I'm tired. Like, and furthermore, mm. somebody's waiting for me. I've got to get back. Somebody's mm. waiting for me, you know. And so I don't recommend people do that. You know, just, you know, try, <laughs> try to keep yourself in a meditative state. <laughs> but, <laughs> seriously, how much time have I got to... I'm representing someone who can't represent themselves. Yeah. And, but, you know, there are, there are people who will take advantage. So, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go too much further, but you were talking about some negative things. There must be some positive things associated with this. So, you know, I'm Ari, so it's a privilege to be in service. I, I have felt like it's a privilege yes. to be yes. in service, to be trusted. I really have. And then after they pass, there's a whole other set of things that happen, you know, which form do you go to where you got to register that this, you got to go from this office to that office. You got to wait, you got to get an appointment. You got to get this before you can go to the funeral yeah, director, the and, the funeral director yeah. and then the yeah. mortuary. And then, you know, what are they doing with the body? You know? And, um, and when yeah. you shop, if you have to shop for the person who has passed, what do you get? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like who, who takes you down the road? Yeah, you know, mm. these are things I think that it would be really good to just be able to click on the now yes. they passed or click on and the. I'm, yeah. and, I'm yes. give, and I'm going to give you a heading that should make you laugh. Coffin guilt. You mean whether you get a coffin or a casket? No, the coffin guilt because the when the person that's taken care of the parent will say, well, you know, this coffin is good enough. The guilty members of the family who were not there, that's not good enough for my mom, and my mom needs to have the, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> they want to, you know, the maximum grade because they're, they're managing their guilt, you know? Can so use another word, please, another word. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's guilt, but maybe it's, maybe it's a misplaced, maybe they just, you know, they, they couldn't deal with the caring of the elder. You know, like, mm. we've had to adjust. But, but not yeah. everybody can. And mm. maybe they just can't, they can't do that. They, they can't be the one who's going to do the intimate hygiene thing. They can't. No, but, that, but, that, but that's, that's less the issue. It's more about 
the, the, the person that's been completely hands off, you know, I don't have time to visit, I'm too busy because my work and this and that and what have you. But once they pass, then they're saying, you can't pay a thousand for that coffin. We need to get the 5,000 one and, you know, or the $10,000 one yeah, or whatever. Yeah, that's what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 I think I'd like another word though. I don't like yeah, that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Even if it means guilt. I don't like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, it, it, maybe it's their way of, of making a contribution. Yeah. My mother yeah. or my father yeah. was, good enough for something better than that they deserve, they deserve the best and they have to yes. go out in style yeah. and you know all yes. of that yeah yes mm. yes, yes so maybe mm. that's what it is that mm. oh i guess. can that be part of a difficult conversation that we have with a person before the transition if we can get some of the details from them because i know some persons will say like my father a few weeks ago in the hospital said um when i die my funeral i with his mortality but sometimes some persons are not faced with it with my mother she didn't say anything um i basically we basically give her i don't mean her heritage um of intention for me but my father he was able he's able to speak and say what he wants and don't want but sometimes when when elder transition you don't know what to do i mm -hmm. you touch base on that so i think that is really important because when my mom transitioned i didn't know what to do i didn't know what for her home I didn't know anything about planning a funeral. Nada. Zilt. Mm -hmm. um, and my brother, he didn't know either. So I remember the day when she was here, and I was in the state. But I remember looking up, and the police, because the police come when someone transitions, and they were asking, okay, what funeral home are you using? I don't know. I tell what funeral home. My brother don't know. And I remember I was crying. I was, I was in the state. But in that moment, moment i still remember looking at my uh, looking up at my brother and he was hitting his head he was like they keep asking me they keep asking me which one i want to use and i don't know i don't know right until um someone called and someone said you know use such and such a funeral home but you still know these things unless yeah. you know yeah and you know yeah, know yeah. what just the arrangements part and of maybe it. not have the conversation when they're actually in the hospital on the bed maybe we can no, have it but earlier before, yes, <laughs> yes yes yeah but, you know no, no, um, no like to talk about death mm. no who does um my um my ex-wife grandmother um yeah grandmother um kept calling her and saying look i want to talk about i want to talk about i want and no 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 granny you're not gonna die you're not gonna die i don't want to you know and there was a whole yeah. denial and in mm. the end and, in, and she couldn't face it. So in the end, mm -hmm. I, as the um, in-law, mm -hmm. had to go and sit down with her and work out what her wishes were. Yeah. You know, and it was complicated because what she had had to be aggregated across seven different structures and families and what have you. Um, mm -hmm. So that was complicated. Um, but then, <laughs> you know, ultimately we found it couldn't be implemented. Mm -hmm. because um the those who were on the land mm -hmm. um claimed it as kind of historic rights mm -hmm. you know and the mind the, the mindset that if you're in england or in america you have money you don't need what's yeah. yeah so trying to um aggregate and compensate people for what you know to honor the wishes of somebody that's passed became impossible and very difficult and it ended up that um my ex-wife and i ended up spending a lot of money with solicitors trying to take this thing forward you know and in the end just giving up yeah. you know in the end just completely giving up and of course um i don't know what it's like in barbados but solicitors in grenada know of this infrastructure and this game and in you know I would say the solicitors happily take your money <laughs> knowing that this thing can't be resolved yeah you know and um because that keeps them in business you know and the whole thing just drags on and on and on and, and in the end we saying well hang on a minute you know she's left i don't know something worth a, 
a thousand pounds and we spend 700 pounds trying to trying to do this of our money that we're not going to get back and you know we need to stop there has to be some good things though and um, oh, good things good things yeah, right yeah. we don't so you know yeah. we can't cover everything today but there has to be some good things and there have to be things that also that you you know like we, we talked about you know signs that they're becoming more dependent yes but towards the end there are things like breathing and traveling and all these kinds of use of language which we won't go into right now but i think mm. we need to uh, like if there's a category if i was going to do a 15 minutes on it then you know what are you what what should you listen mm. for what should you look at what what is likely to be happening um that kind of stuff from a african centered perspective cuz mm. you know um Clinicians and, and, and Eurocentric people are going to have their own idea about stuff, but we know because it's been passed down some stuff. You know, it's gonna, it's inevitable, right. gonna happen, likely to happen. Um, you know, like when they're not, when they're looking in your direction, but they're not looking at you, like they're looking yeah. at you, kind of, yeah. kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, um, and 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 I'm mindful of time now. So uh, also. But um, closing out now. Mm, um, it is, it is the stories, and the history, that they carry, as part of our oral tradition, and for us, it's the last opportunity, to, get some of the bits of information, that, we weren't privy to, before. Yes. You know, is that thing about, um when they realize that they're going, they're more likely to want to tell you the things that they didn't tell you before. You know, that's one strand because they're acknowledging you are the big people now and they are becoming the child now. Mm -hmm. But also um, Alzheimer's and dementia creates its own phenomena of joy because the, they regress through childhood. So the conversations and awareness of childhood become richer if you know what questions to ask them to tap in to get mm. to get that information. And they will have information about themselves as a child, but their parents and their grandparents. So you can go back, you know, generationally and find out some information um, as they get you know more into dementia is that is that your closing out uh <laughs> contribution i think so okay yeah so i'll take that as a positive thing okay yeah Alrighty. yes it's i'm ari you're muted i'm hearing you no no you've muted yourself and i'm muted yeah i know no, we're not hearing you. No, no, something's happening. Testing, testing, one, two, three. We can hear you. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, my experience is last two weeks. I got to spend some time with my father that I ordinarily would not have um, spent with him. Um, I got to accept him for who he was and, you know, what he was is um he told me he loved me <laughs> for the first time in my life ever me and my brother um yeah. last week so that was that was that was something and he he repeated it again uh, in that moment of time even though i think i forgive him before i forgive him even more mm. we get mm. to see sometimes you know Sometimes people who we think are this and that, when we get to see them in their in their yeah. humble stages, you know, when when life has humbled you, you know, like as children, we see our parents as these really strong individuals that can overcome anything and do anything. And then we, we see them, we get an opportunity to see them in their humble stages not to be taken advantage of but 
it's like if you like if you care more for them mm. uh, lack of a better word like even with my mother she cared for me a lot i got the opportunity then to to, to be there for her and to and to love her mm-hmm. you know and to take care of her the way how she took care of me and even my father even though i didn't get that i'm giving the opportunity to still take care of him um getting the opportunity to say to hear him say it, and he said it to me and my brother that he loved that he loves us you know it's like it's a good thing yeah it's a good thing that's great for healing okay all right well sounds like this is a goer sounds like this is a thing that has to be done yeah. um, and 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 you both have um helped to affirm that this this choice is a a, a purposeful one and i really respect both of you um, you operate in my private and my professional lives. And I think um, I made a commitment to myself years ago that they were not going to be separate lives. I was not going to have a public life or a professional life and a community life. I was just going to have a life. And uh, there are areas where I really got the benefit of that. There are areas where I still have to work it out because, you know, at work, they don't know who I am. <laughs> but, Sister, I married this. <laughs> and in the community, they don't know who I am, but Brother King Royston does. And so I am actually being able to bring those things together. And I think having you both as the ones who are just saying whether there's some, whether there's some things in, in here to share and contribute to our well-being, um, it's a blessing to be able to have this conversation. So I give thanks. Mm-hmm.